On behalf of the board and staff at IMFG, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's presentation titled A Negotiated Approach, Evaluating Affordable Housing Outcomes from Section 37 Agreements. My name is Thomas Hatchard and I'm the Manager of Programs and Research here at the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance at the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy. Although this event is virtual and I realize that everyone is in a different location, I wish to acknowledge this land on which the University of Toronto operates. For thousands of years, it has been the traditional land of the Huron-Wendat, the Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Today, this meeting place is still the home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. I'd like to thank the external funders of the Institute, Havana Capital, Maitre, the City of Toronto, the Region of Halton, and the Region of York. I'd also like to thank the School of Cities for funding IMFG's postdoctoral fellowship. And lastly, I'd like to thank our team at IMFG and Monk, Piali, Daria, and Adam for everything they did to make this event happen today. If you're tweeting about this event, our hashtag is IMFG Talks and our Twitter, hand, Twitter handle is IMFG Toronto. Today's event is the second of two seminars by our 2020-2021 postdoctoral fellow, Julie Ma. Her presentation will focus on Section 37, a tool that city of, the City of Toronto and other Ontario municipalities use to negotiate community benefits in exchange for increased density or other zoning changes. In particular, Julie will be looking at how the City of Toronto has used th Section 37 to fund or build affordable housing. Julie's research comes at an important moment. The City of Toronto is developing an inclusionary zoning policy that would require developers to set aside a specific percentage of units for affordable housing in certain cases. And Section 37 itself is changing after recent amendments were made by the province of Ontario. In this context, Julie's research provides a valuable analysis of what Section 37 has achieved in terms of affordable housing. And this analysis will be helpful in evaluating future policies on affordable housing as well. So uh, in terms of the logistics for today, Julie will present for about half an hour, and then we're gonna move straight into a Q&A. So please do use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and send in questions throughout the talk. We'll try to get to as many as we can. So let me introduce Julie. Julie, as I mentioned, is the 2020-21 IMFG Postdoctoral Fellow. She holds a PhD in planning from the University of Toronto, and her research focuses on affordable housing issues, evictions, gentrification and displacement, and equitable development approaches. Julie has also worked as a planning consultant on several community improvement plans, cultural plans, and economic development strategies. Julie, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, I'll just start sharing the screen. Uh, okay, um, so the, okay, it's good. Um, so thank you so much, uh, Thomas, for um, that introduction. Um, and thank you all of you for uh, attending the talk today. Uh, so this afternoon, I will present preliminary results from my postdoctoral research, um, which is a historical look at the affordable housing benefits that have been secured through Section 37 between the years of 1988 and 2018. My talk will unfold along these lines. First, um, I'll introduce my research and methodology. Second, I'll briefly discuss the historical context regarding funding for affordable housing. Then I'll present um, my preliminary findings on the spatial temporal analysis of affordable housing benefits that have been secured through Section 37. I'll then conclude by discussing um, the issues with including affordable housing um, before we move on to the Q&A. So for my master's research, um, which was conducted uh, such a long time ago in 2009 and 2010, I evaluated the inclusionary housing practices in Canada's three largest cities, Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto. As part of this, I looked at the voluntary strategy for the inclusion of affordable housing in Montreal, the 20% um, social housing policy in Vancouver, and the use of Section 37 in Toronto to generate affordable housing. So this research is essentially an update of that study, though um, I'm really just focusing on Toronto. Specifically, I'm examining Section 37 data that contain affordable housing benefits from um, those years, the over a 30 year period, to understand what was produced in the end. 
An important part of this research has been the creation of a unique database that focuses on the type of affordable housing benefits that have been secured. But first, before I outline my research methodology, I want to provide some important definitions and contextual information. To start, so what is Section 37? Thomas kind of had a brief introduction on it, but um, I think this graphic is really good in illustrating how the old Section 37 regime has worked and continues um, to work as municipalities have until September 2022 to transition to the new community benefits um, charges or the CBC regime. Under the old Section 37 of the Planning Act, municipalities were allowed to provide increases in density and or height in exchange for community benefits such as public art, um, daycares, um, or affordable housing. Now, the wording in the Planning Act actually didn't specifically say community benefits. Instead, um, they used the terms um, facilities, services, or matters. Now, this is a bit vague, though the language was designed to be vague to provide maximum flexibility to municipalities who could then define community benefits in a way that fits their specific local context. Now, to define two more important concepts. First, value capture is the idea that government entities should capture some of the increase in land value that results from public investments and public actions for public benefit. And this stems from a line of thought that increases in the value of land should accrue to society as a whole, in the words of Susan Feinstein since it was the collectivity that created the value arising from that use of land. Incentive-based zoning policies can be used to provide density bonuses in exchange for public benefits such as affordable housing. And in this way, it resembles a voluntary inclusionary housing policy. And Toronto's incentive-based zoning approach uses Section 37 of the Planning Act. Second, Inclusionary zoning, or IZ, is a value capture tool that requires developers to set aside a percentage of their new market housing units as affordable housing. Um, it can be voluntary or mandatory, uh, but obviously it's far more complex than that. And there are issues with properly defining the tool as the structure of inclusionary policies vary greatly from one jurisdiction to the next. And as many of you probably already know, and as Thomas uh, has indicated at the beginning, the City of Toronto is in the process of developing an IZ policy and final recommendations are expected to go before council in uh, September. So the question that guides the study is, how effective have value capture tools been in the development of new affordable housing? in Toronto. To answer this question, the study uses a mixed methods approach to analyze Section 37 data and map where, how many, and what type of units were produced under the previous Section 37 regime in order to create a baseline upon which a future IZ approach could then be evaluated against. As part of this, I also analyzed council reports and bylaws and have conducted qualitative interviews with city planners and other planning uh, professionals. And I'm in the process of analyzing uh, these interviews um, and hope to conduct a few more. In terms of evaluation criteria, the evaluation um, looked at um, how many units were produced, the depth and length of affordability, and the geographic distribution of affordable units. So it's important to root the preliminary findings within its historical context, especially in terms of the funding that was available during that time or the lack thereof. For those working in the nonprofit housing sector, the year 1993 was a key turning point. In the 1993 budget, the federal government ended funding for new social housing and starting in 1996, the administration of social housing programs were transferred to the provinces. 
In Ontario, the responsibility for social housing was then downloaded to municipalities without concomitant funding. Now, this table is based um, on an excellent graph um, in Greg Sutter's book, Still Renovating a History of Canadian Social Housing Policy. It illustrates the drop in average annual social housing commitments in Canada after 1993, when commitments significantly decreased from almost 20,000 sorry, from almost 20,000 units a year to just over 4,000 units nationwide. There was minimal re-engagement starting in the early 2000s, but production levels um, really did not return to even half the pre-1993 levels. Meanwhile, during this period of uh, social housing retrenchment and devolution, the federal government made it easier for people to purchase a house by lowering interest rates, reducing required down payments, um, and creating the home buyers plan, which permitted people to use some of their RSPs for down payments. And these two different paths um, are what David Halchansky has called Canada's dual housing policy. And we see the impacts of that dual housing policy in the production or lack of production of affordable housing since the mid 1990s. It's not surprising that the numbers have been low in relation to market rate housing production. For example, between 1996 and 2017, whereas 1.3 million new condo units and houses were built in the province, only 20,000 affordable rental units were constructed. And this represented 1.5% of the total supply. And if we look more specifically at Toronto, we see that a significant number of condo units were added between 2010 and 2018, almost 120,000 condo units. And in comparison, during that same period, only 3,604 affordable rental homes were completed, um, which represented 2.5% of the total supply. Now, just to provide sort of brief overview of section, section 37 practices in Toronto, um, the type of benefits that have been secured have included uh, streetscape improvements, park improvements, um, and public art, such as the stainless steel uh, sculpture, which is in front of the Shangri-La Hotel downtown. Um, and according to um, OP policies, section 37 applies to developments that have more than 10,000 square meters um, of GFA or uh, gross floor area. Um, in terms of calculating section 37, there's no citywide formula due to fears of, of potential legal challenges um, on the basis that it could be considered an illegal tax. So most agreements are negotiated on a case by case basis. Toronto's large sites policy still uses section 37 for its implementation, but it is a more formalized inclusionary housing policy that applies to sites greater than five hectares and requires 20% of additional units to be affordable. The large sites policy tries to address the political limitations of section 37 by making affordable housing the first priority community benefit. So there were 773 Section 37 agreements over the 30-year period, um, and 36% of those agreements contained an affordable housing benefit in some form of another. Um, one agreement, though, typically would contain multiple benefits. So this pie chart shows the breakdown of the type of benefits that have been secured in the city as a proportion of all benefits. And we see that affordable housing contributions um, accounted for 15% of benefits, whereas uh, parks, uh, for example, represented 21%. And if we look at the total number of Section 37 agreements by year, compared with the number of agreements containing 
um, some form of affordable housing benefit, um, which is represented um, in these orange bars, um, we see that the total number of Section 37 agreements um, sort of started gaining steam in the early 2000s, um, and the number of agreements containing affordable housing benefits uh, starting to increase in 2013. And if we break it down by secured money amounts, we see that over $65 million have been secured for affordable and social housing, um, which is the fourth highest amount. And the most amount of money um, was secured for community recreation and art spaces. In terms of actual money received by the city for affordable and social housing, over $59.6 million was received. And as of uh, December 2020, uh, $35.6 million had been spent. So it's important to note that multiple benefits are sometimes lumped together. For example, in the database, we would say um, $100,000 for um, parks and streetscape improvements um, and or uh, affordable housing. So in those cases, I indicated that all of those benefits were secured, but I didn't include the monetary contributions in the dollar amounts. So these money amounts, um, especially for parks um, and roads and community spaces are an underestimate. And if we break down the affordable housing benefits, we find that most agreements involved money for affordable and social housing, um, and only 11% um, involved the actual provision of physical affordable units. Other housing benefits included size restrictions um, and family size units, rental housing upgrades and protection, uh, land or buildings conveyed for affordable housing, um, and low end a market housing provision. Um, and depending on when rental replacement units were secured, Section 37 was used as a tool to secure rental replacement units as a legal convenience which means that rental uh, replacement units shouldn't be considered um, as a community benefit. Though prior to 2006, um, 2007, it may have been secured as a benefit in certain cases, given the repeal of the Rental Housing Protection Act in 1998. This graphic shows the percentage breakdown based on the number of benefits by select wards with 24 or more Section 37 agreements. Um, the affordable housing benefits are seen here in the green bar. Um, and we see that the downtown wards um, have pursued affordable housing benefits at a higher rate than other wards, say in Etobicoke um, or in North York. And in Ward 20, um, which was Adam Vaughn's old ward for many years, developers were expected to provide contributions for affordable housing and social housing capital improvements. So this CORPLEF map shows the geographic distribution of Section 37 agreements um, based on the old 44 ward system. The darker colors um, kind of indicate where Section 37 and essentially where development activity was concentrated in the city. So you see that development was um, really occurred in the downtown areas and along the subway lines, especially along uh, the Young Line. And for the most part, there hasn't been a lot of Section 37 developments in many of the city's neighborhood improvement areas, which are, you can see here, outlined in red. Um, these are underserved areas. There are, are a few NIAs or neighborhood improvement areas in Scarborough, um, which have seen uh, a little bit more Section 37 agreements. However, historically, um, these neighborhoods uh, or priority neighborhoods, as they were known, have not really benefited from development downtown because of the requirement for a reasonable planning relationship and a clear connection or nexus between the contributing development and the community benefits. 
Um, and this is stated in the Section 37 implementation guidelines. Um, so a reasonable planning relationship has been generally seen as involving an appropriate geographic relationship. So community benefits are typically located near the development, sometimes on site, or in the local area, typically though within the ward boundaries. So this map shows where money for affordable and social housing has been secured. And we see that most of the money um, is really concentrated in the downtown wards. This map shows the geographic distribution of secured physical affordable units in the city. Um, though it doesn't really include, it doesn't include the cases where a percentage of, un of units were secured. Um, you see that there are units kind of located in the downtown central area, but also units in North York um, and some in Scarborough. And if we look at the geographic distribution of the affordable ownership units, um, which are highlighted in red, we see that they're located in various parts of the city. Whereas social housing, again, highlighted in red, has been located um, in the downtown area. So, this table shows the breakdown of secured affordable housing units um, by year and by type. And we see that some social housing was secured in the early years, um, but since the early 2000s, the affordable rental that was secured was mostly um, at the average market rent level, um, or also known as one times AMR. Um, and in total, over 2,300 physical affordable units were secured, um, though this number is an undercount as it doesn't include um, projects with percentage secured for affordable housing. So this table shows the summary of secured uh, affordable rental units, so just the rental units by depth of affordability. And we see that 8.5% of rental units were secured at 80% of average market rent or AMR. Um, over 45% of units were secured um, at the average market rent level um, and social housing accounted for almost 30% of the units. So once the money was secured for affordable housing um, or social housing capital improvements, um, one question I had um, was what happens to the money after it has been transferred to the capital revolving fund for affordable housing? So following the money to see what was actually produced is not an easy task, but in doing so, I think it really highlights the complexity of the process in terms of the different actors involved and the fact that money has to be cobbled together from different developments over different time periods in order to make a significant contribution towards the creation of new affordable housing. And the vignettes that I will show, um, I think really illustrate that. So for example, in the, this top example, um, to come up with the $1.5 million for the acquisition and renovation of a 15 unit rooming house property in Parkdale, um, which is now run by the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust, funds from five different developments spanning four years were leveraged. And in this example on the bottom, um, Section 37 funds ranging from $1,100 to over $2 million were assembled from six different developments over a 13-year period to provide the Kensington Market Community Land Trust um, with $3 million to purchase, renovate, and operate 12 residential units um, in Kensington Market.
And just to provide one more vignette. I think this example really highlights how Section 37 funds were cobbled together from 12 different developments over a five year span, evolving over 4,200 condo units to fund the $6 million renovation and modernization of a property on Parliament Street to a few properties on Parliament Street to provide supportive housing for 44 individuals experiencing homelessness. And the money ranged from $102,000 um, to $1.8 million. Okay, so we've looked at what the public got in return for public incentives as it relates to affordable housing benefits. Um, now let's look at the other side of the coin in terms of what was built in exchange for these benefits. So as part of the database creation, I also documented the type of proposed developments and the proposed number of dwelling units for those agreements that involved affordable housing contributions. Um, and we see that over 104,000 dwelling units were proposed. Of those, 72% were condo units and 8.3% were purpose-built rental units. And in return, this is sort of just a summary of the affordable housing benefits that uh, we've already kind of gone over, but um, in return over 65 million were secured um, for affordable housing and social housing capital improvements and well over 2,300 physical affordable units were secured, um, which represents 2.2% of these units. And this is an undercount um, as though, as I previously mentioned. So these are preliminary thoughts related to the issues with securing more affordable housing through a negotiated incentive-based approach. And one major issue involves competing benefits and priorities um, as affordable housing is just one potential benefit. Often there are political limitations based on each councillor's priorities in terms of what type of community benefits are needed. And in the downtown wards, affordable housing has been a priority as we've seen in the data, but in other words, the councillor and the community may think that parks or community centers are more of a priority. So even when affordable housing benefits were secured, the funds extracted from individual projects were often insufficient in of itself to build affordable housing, which resulted in a piecemeal process given the dearth of funding from senior levels of government. You see this in the vignette. Without this funding, it takes significant time and effort together and that really shows the complexity of the process considering that it is negotiated considering considering that it is negotiated on a case-by-case -case basis the incentive-based approach also shows the interplay between structure and agency given the tools at their disposal um, and given the structural constraints some planners and counselors have really pushed Section 37 to its effective limits to try and generate as much affordable housing as possible. And Section 37 certainly was useful in generating some affordable housing, but not nearly enough when compared to the substantial need. And to sum up, the preliminary findings I think really show the limits of relying on the private sector to produce affordable housing and the limits of using an incentive-based negotiated approach to generate new affordable housing. So given these political and funding limitations, housing advocates and the city have pushed for the authority to implement an inclusionary zoning program um, for a very long time. Um, in fact, I was just going through my old files from my 2010 research, and I found a consultant study 
um, on IZ that was conducted uh, for the City of Toronto in 1991. So 30 years later, final recommendations for an IZ policy will finally go before City Council. And lastly, a centralized database that tracks the affordable units that have been secured and produced through Section 37 um, doesn't appear to be publicly accessible. Um, and this holds implications for the IZ program as the monitoring and the administration of affordable units is an important component of any successful IZ program. So thank you for listening. Um, I look forward to hearing your comments and your questions. Uh, please feel free to email me if you would prefer. Um, if, if you have comments, feedback on the presentation, on some of the data and the spatial analysis, um, or if you have questions. I'll stop sharing. There we go. All right. Thank you so much, Julie. That was fantastic. A very thorough presentation. Uh, lots to discuss. So I'm going to get started with some questions, but uh, everyone, please, uh, we will be going to the audience questions. So please send in your, your questions in the Q&A and, and we'll get to them very soon. But to, to kick, off, kick us off, Julie, um, you mentioned in, in the presentation there that the city can use Section 37 uh, to negotiate for affordable housing in a few different ways. So they can uh, they can secure money that can then be used to build uh, affordable housing or they can secure actual units. And can you maybe just discuss a little bit what are some of the considerations for choose, that the city has for choosing one route over the other? Well, it's also the developer's willingness to include actual physical units within their development. Um, sometimes, um, they are very reluctant to actually include uh, a component of, of affordable housing in their otherwise, say, condo-like market rate housing um, developments. Um, so that's an issue in New York City. You probably heard that um, there was a huge outcry um, as part of, they have a mandatory inclusionary zoning policy, but there was a huge outcry over the fact that there were like separate entrances for those accessing the affordable units versus those accessing the market rate uni units. And they're calling that the poor door. Um, so there is sort of more complications in terms of like actually including affordable units, but also in the fact that's sort of where you want to go because construction costs are so high, you do want the developer to actually build those units. Like that's that's the whole idea of inclusionary zoning. Though we've seen that, like in those vignettes, it kind of shows the complexity of the process, but it also shows um, the fact that you can use that money to purchase small sites um, and then convey it to, say, community land trusts like the Parkdale Neighborhood Land Trust, uh, like the Kensington Market Community Land Trust. So that is one kind of um, use of having that money, and that where you can then use that money to go into that kind of uh, acquisition, renovation, um, and operations of deeply affordable housing units. Right, so it gives you that, that flexibility. Um, you mentioned that the, the, one, of the, the certain, uh, one of the considerations is, is what, how did developers, developers react? And actually we have an audience question about that in relation to inclusionary zoning. Um, which is something the city's working on. So how, you know, how have developers reacted to inclusionary zoning? Is there a different, have they had a different reaction than they may have to section 37 uh, historically? Um, so to, yeah, how do developers react to inclusionary zoning? So just like based yeah. on like previous research, of course this is, and then some of my other research in terms of, um, in talking uh, with the development industry, um, yeah, there is that reluctance um, to the policy because there is that uncertainty first in terms of how do you then value that land? Um, what is the cost? What are the added costs? You're essentially, they're thinking that, well, if we are, we're losing profit, um, if we do provide um, this, uh, these affordable units, it might affect the bottom line in terms of the pro forma. So it might actually affect the economic feasibility 
um, of the project. So that's a legitimate concern. Um, I think it also um, in the inclusionary zoning panel that we had earlier um, in the winter that the, the, you know, Jeannie did a really good job of kind of talking about those different development uh, concerns. Um, you can, I think now they're coming around to the idea of inclusionary zoning, it seems, but there's still pushback. But from when I started researching this in 20, 2009 to now, it's, it's interesting to see how the discourse around inclusionary zoning has changed in the development industry in terms of, no, this is actually just going to increase costs and make, you know, you're passing on the cost to the buyer. You're actually gonna affect the housing markets and housing values to now, okay, we know affordable housing is an issue and a crisis, it's a crisis in the city. Um, but there's still a little bit of pushback um, to how it's actually going to work out. Right. Um, we have a question here, uh, going back to section 37. So could you say more about the role of the ward counselor in this process? Um, are either the nets, did funds collected from section 37 cross ward boundaries? And uh, will the role of the local counselor, like, uh, counselor change in the new regime? As far as so, uh, it's kind of what I was talking about in terms of that uh, planning relationship or that nexus where you you do need to have it, that sort of that geographic relationship between the contributing development um, and the community benefits. So typically they've interpreted that as um, being, you know, within the ward boundaries. Um, of course, when money goes into, say, the capital revolving fund, say, for affordable housing, that's all I was really looking at, it may cross ward boundaries, but I, the ones that I've looked at, um, I haven't, uh, it's sort of staying within those wards. Um, I might be um, corrected if other people actually do know of uh, instances where that has happened, uh, please let me know. Um, in terms of the citywide, that's sort of an issue as well, why you also have these um, in planning what they call like, you know, linkage fees where other communities outside of areas where there is a lot of development happening can then benefit from this development through these linkage fees. So there has been discussion upon um, about sort of having these citywide benefits um, instead of just accruing say within an award, then it kind of goes the other neighborhoods and other wards can kind of benefit from this development. Right. Um, and on that note, I guess there's a few questions on, on, on all the data you presented. So I'll go through a few of these, but one of them is, um, do we know how many new builds happened in the neighborhood improvement areas? And I guess that relates to this question of if it's gonna stay in, in a ward, it, it, that there might be a relationship between how many how much build uh, development is actually happening in those in that area? So is that is there a relationship there? Um, I can look. Let me just bring up my map. I can look at that. That doesn't seem like it's sort of if that map where I had that geographic distribution, that choropleth map, it kind of like the ones. Um, a lot of the neighborhood improvement areas were in areas that were that saw Section 37 agreements number under sort of 11 in those um, in the neighborhood improvement areas. So, of course, related to benefits, if you don't have a lot of developments for Section 37 in terms of meeting that 10,000 square meter threshold as well. Um, you can't really secure benefits. So you obviously need a lot of development happening and that uh, that meet the threshold under the, the OP policies um, in order to kind of generate benefits as well. I can look into more detail if somebody is really interested in that, just uh, message me and I, I can uh, provide more details. Yeah, no, of course. And just getting to some of the other data questions. So someone noted that you found that uh, around 2,300 units were secured, but you did mention that that doesn't include projects with the, the percentage secured for for housing. Can you just explain again why you didn't you didn't include those units and um, 
and the person asking the question wonders if you have a rough estimate of how many affordable units those may have been. This is why these are preliminary findings. So this is, I'm still working on this part. Um, there's about 16 projects that I have isolated. Again, I have to pull up my different spreadsheets for this. Um, I can go into more detail, but yeah, it's, uh, it's also figuring out what happened in the end. So if, say if it's like 30% um, of units are at say below market, um, ownership units are to be that below market uh, market to housing provision. Well, how many units were actually built? So then you can then say, okay, if 30% of say 100, then I can add that. But that's additional, like this is like really following the bread breadcrumbs in terms of like what happened then for all of these individual developments. So that's something that um, uh, I am kind of looking at. Um, I'm also looking at in terms of the funding programs that kind of went into uh, producing these units, how affordable, the length of affordability, um, um, and, and so forth. So that work is, is continuing. Of course, it's, it's very, it's, it's time consuming to do that. Yeah. That's why I didn't include it for this presentation, but it will be in the report. And that report will be out with Ima G soon. <laughs> um, so next question is about both uh, inclusionary zoning and section 37, but is there any political will or funding to use either IZ or section 37 for more subsidized housing? For many people, market 100% of market rate, 80% of market rate would not be affordable when based on CMHC's, CMHC's definition, which is 30% of gross income. So the question is, you know, is there is there a will to use some of the either Section 37 or in the future inclusionary zoning for something that would get built, you know, a bit more subsidized than than what is uh, the market rate at 100 percent or 80 percent? So, as I understand it, the that informal inclusionary zoning program that the policy that's um, going to um, go through uh, to count city council in September, like it's separate from Section 37. But they're looking to say if um, developers wanted to provide um, deeper affordability or more units, then they would look into kind of seeing how they can get funding perhaps through open doors to kind of to help um, with that. Um, I'm not sure with the new, uh, because it's be moving on to the CBC regime, the new community benefits charges system that how that will then come into play and how that will work with inclusionary zoning to kind of create um, more affordability. Um, so that's something I think the city is also trying to figure out that piece as well, because there's a 4% cap with the, that's this new, the new CBCs. Right, right. So I guess uh, drawing on that and just in uh, terms of inclusionary zoning, you now I'm curious what you think you know, your, your presentation did highlight the complexity of Section 37. So that raises the question, um, you know, maybe how, how would inclusionary zoning improve on, on that? And we did have a, a question from the audience that sort of is tied to that as well, which is thinking about how, um, uh, how inclusionary zoning might deliver spatial equity for racialized and low income communities in Toronto's inner suburbs. Is, you know, would, it, uh, would inclusionary zoning actually be an improvement, as, as being proposed in Toronto, be an improvement in, in those terms as well? That is, so it's with the new amendments that it has to be um, within those PMTSAs, so the protected metro transit station areas. Um, and then the city, like with the proposed um, recommendations, they have that strong market areas, moderate market areas. So I think depending on where that's located, um, we'd have to see, like we're, if we're looking specifically at the city's uh, regular sort of proposed yeah. recommendations that we have to see like depending on which areas, whether that would be covered um, or not, um, that's something. But I think sort of, oh, sorry, Thomas. No, no, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Um, so we would, there's that. Um, I think in terms of improving, getting back to your question on, on improving on Section 37, this wouldn't be a negotiated 
thing. It's not like a case by case, like section 37 and how it works right now, right? So it's sort of like, this is a mandatory thing. You need to provide it if you're in these areas um, and you meet the threshold um, according to the policies, you provide these uh, X number of units, right? So you're not negotiating, um, which does take time. And also it depends on the experience of the counselors, the experience of, uh, of staff involved in terms of also the valuations, um, how land, how that land value is calculated. Um, and then each site has its own kind of different um, challenges as well. Um, so that's something the, the numbers that the city might have and what a developer might have might be two different numbers. Um, and then trying to negotiate that is, uh, is something else. Right, yeah. We have a couple of questions here that, that dig into the intergovernmental piece of it. Um, so, and, and the role of the province. So one question is how much of uh, section 37 social housing and rentals uh, that were produced, how much of them received additional provincial and or federal subsidies to help their feasibility? Yeah, so that's what I'm compiling right now. So there's some, like each one is different. Um, so if I just go back to like, just I'm just looking at a at one of the sites right now that this was earlier on, it's like in 1991. So, you know, land off site was conveyed to the city to actually accommodate up to 46 social housing units. Um, plus uh, cash in lieu payments um, for 10 units. So that's like one example. Another one um, in terms of funding, um, this was an ownership one, kind of then they accessed city's home ownership assistance uh, program um, and they were funded in that way. Um, again, these are like the sort of the nitty gritty stuff. And if you really are interested in that, just like, again, message me and I can provide more details. So following on that, on the question of sort of the role of the province or the federal government, one person asked, and I had this question for you as well, sort of, you know, given everything you said, do you think Section 37 is an appropriate or effective way to provide affordable housing? And, and they mentioned, you know, should we instead be focusing on advocating for more provincial federal funding, a more extensive IZ policy? So well, what are your thoughts on that? It, of course, it's like, if I think I always go back to actually what David Helchansky said in terms of you know low-income tenants generate a social need for housing they don't really they don't generate a market demand so the market will never build for a certain segment and it's like it's up to political will it's up to the society to decide do we want to provide decent affordable housing for those who cannot afford um sort of this basic human right Right, so that's something I feel very strongly about, but it does kind of go back to that, that you do need to have access, senior level, um, well, funding from senior levels of government in order to have an effective um, and robust affordable housing, a deeply affordable housing program. Yeah, so, and I, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, that, so yeah, more money <laughs> definitely is needed. And it is, it's about political will. How much do you allocate to this, um, to the production of social housing, of affordable housing? We kind of saw what happened when the federal government got out of the business of building social housing after 1993. And um, now they, with the national housing strategy, they are, the funds have started to um, kind of open up again and they're starting to get back into the housing business, but yeah, more has definitely has to do, be done. So uh, following on that, I mean, one person asked how much, if any responsibility does the city have in terms of the lack of affordable housing when they've only directed 15% of section 37 funds to affordable housing? The, the, the person who asked the question says, it seems a desire of councils to direct a majority of funds to parks and streetscape. Do you think that's fair? Is I mean, you've noted a, a bunch of different factors here, so. Yeah, like in the downtown wards, um, you saw sort of in that graph how you know there was you know affordable housing was kind of pursued at definitely um, a high rate and it was considered mm -hmm. a priority than in other wards um so it really is like sort of um it's very political some counselors might think that oh well you know parks are more important and plus that's something 
um, in terms of re-election that he can point to, that everybody can enjoy using these parks and these kind of community facilities rather than um, affordable housing. Um, each community is different. I think they would, some might um, prioritize community centers um, over affordable housing. Right, yeah. Uh, two, two people with the same question here, so I'll make, have to ask it. Um, uh, talking about that, you, you mentioned that 58% of the money received for affordable and social housing has, um, has not been, oh, sorry, only 58% of the money received has been spent. Um, someone here mentions that there's around 30 million available. First, is that, is that correct? And if not, what's, um, what's holding back the spending? So, yeah, so go on, let me just bring up that of that, yeah, 35.6 million have been spent. Yes, it's, I, that's a good question. Why, what's holding it? It's, again, it could be just, I think the vignettes kind of, they've shown like how you have to cobble together all yeah. of this different money. So what are you going to do with it? It's uh, it's a far it's it's a complicated uh, process, but that is a good question, and I don't yeah. have to for that. Uh, a question here that just that you may want to uh, build on a little bit. Um, they're asking, um, were the affordable units that were provided by developers, you touched on this a little bit in the presentation, but were the affordable units provided by developers required to be affordable in perpetuity or only for a limited time? So maybe you can reiterate that and maybe go into maybe again, what are some, is this just a matter of because of what developers are, are willing to do or are there other considerations here? Yeah, so that's, it depends, like each case is different in terms of like how many um, unit, like for how long. So um, it could be for 20 years, I'm trying to bring up that uh, the different, um, so like 20 years um, is common. Um, for ownership units, obviously it's, it's difficult to know because Typically, it's usually only affordable to the first buyer, um, unless they have controls related to that. Um, so there's that. Some it's the 50 years. I see one was for 10 years. So it varies. Um, I do see one for 99. I'm just looking at the filter. Um, so it varies. Yeah. And is there, and I guess it varies based on the negotiation. Is this part, this is part of the, the challenge of negotiations is, is my guess, right? Or are there other reasons as well? It could, well, it's also, it's the money, the mm -hmm. differential and sort of those rents and what's happening with that. Um, there are other factors um, in play and it's like, it'll be different, like depending on that specific type of development and right. what kind of funding went in to actually produce that as well. Um, right. So it's hard to, to, hard to answer that. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, in terms, when there are units, in, affordable units built uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the development, uh, someone's asking who manages and owns the units that are provided within developments, especially when they're mixed in the market condo building. Um, it depends So you would bring in like a partner like Artscape. Um, I know Kahila has also been a partner uh, a few units, um, so they would bring in, so that's also another sort of added um, component of complexity. You have to get these partnerships, you have to bring the partners uh, to the table. Um, so, but yeah, I've seen Artscape, Kahila, um, and, and other uh, partners who then who are involved. Yeah. Other nonprofits, like nonprofits. Right, gotcha. And you mentioned in the presentation, I mean, you go into detail, the complexity of pool, get, getting all the, the funds together, but one person asked also just, you know, the complexity of negotiations. Do you have data on how long a section 37 negotiation might take um, with between the city and the developer? Are these also fairly complex protracted negotiations? I think it's like, it, it might be different for each one. I've heard that some, it, I think it depends. Um, that, and that's something that a more comprehensive survey of planners who have you know, kind of who've who have been involved with these like 
773 agreements can kind of then stay in terms of the length. So I would anecdotally, I've heard sometimes it can be, there is, it is time consuming, but then some may not be, I get, it's hard, sorry, I can't, it's hard for me to answer yeah, that. No, there's no one answer. Yeah, no, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. But some of them can, can go on for a while. Yeah. Um, so I, we're almost running out of time. So I'm going to end with one one final question here. Um, or let me just, uh, so it's on the note of nonprofits. Uh, can you speak more about the very, very limited number of new co-op housing units being supported through Section 37? Um, is this a matter of a lack of sectoral capacity or municipal distrust in the model for governance and manage management that you're aware of? So are you aware of these uh, of these new co-op housing units? Or? Not, that's a great question. Um, I'm not aware of that. Um, but that's, yeah, that's definitely, uh, it's a good question to kind of explore. Yeah, for the research, good right? Research yeah, it's a good <laughs> question. <laughs> Okay, well, I think that's that's a good place to leave it off. I mean, you mentioned Julie, and I'll say that to the audience again that you're this is ongoing research you're doing, and uh, it's for a report that you're you're going to be publishing with IMG. So, so more more to come soon from you. And one thing I failed to mention when I introduced you, Julie, is that you are going to be going to the University of Florida in the fall uh, to to start uh, to be a professor there. So, congratulations on that. Uh, we're very excited for you. Um, so we're reaching the end of our time. So I just want to thank. Thank you again, Julie, um, for the fantastic presentation. I think, you know, you you mentioned like we really are at a turning point here in terms of how the city uh, and the province are, are approaching these questions and uh, having some some numbers so that we can actually then see whether we've we're moving in the right direction is is just fantastic. So this is this has been a really great contribution, and I'm looking forward to the report. I'm sure everyone else is as well. And to the audience, I'll just say uh, that today's event has been recorded, and it will be available on our website soon. Um, the, uh, Julie's presentation will be available as well if you want to take a closer look at all those charts. Um, and you can also please share that video and the presentation with your colleagues who couldn't attend today's event. So thank you everyone for coming and uh, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and evening.